Welcome to the Smart Factory. Hello, this is uh, Mort from English TV uh, and um, dedicated host on all these uh, webinars that we have had so far. Um, I think the program actually have been a really interesting in my opinion. And unfortunately, not so many people have attended, but uh, we rely on the replays. So um, I'm sure that this content is valuable for uh, a lot of people in the printing industry. And I, I once again want to thank all the live viewers but also the uh the sponsors and uh, speakers uh without without you guys no event right and uh this is actually uh an example because uh this session is called uh about how to, how do iot devices actually connect and um actually i wanted some of the vendors in the industry to take that session here and it was maybe because we were a little bit late in the, in the preparation for this, but uh, the three companies we spoke to, they were really interested in this. So I was wondering whether this was about uh, it's difficult or whether this is um, boring <laughs> or it's uh, something that is still a bit uncertain. So from those perspectives, um, I decided to, uh, I have made a few changes to it, but uh, Horizon sponsored me to do a IoT presentation uh, three, four months ago. So I updated the presentation and um, um, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now I'm, of course, way more experienced being here online for the, the past day. So of course, I know a little bit more. But um, without further ado, uh, let me just uh, share my screen so you can at least see what I have prepared. Right? Um, yeah, IoT is uh, short for Internet of Things, and um, uh, Internet of Things is a term that I think a lot of people heard about, or IoT, but maybe not so many people understand and know what this is, what this is about, and uh, why this is something that uh, uh, is uh, interesting for people to understand. Um, when I prepared the presentation or the slides and I found this photo uh, that I'm showing you right now, I found that this is actually a very good way to explain how the internet works. Because the internet works uh, with a lot of connecting nodes where the information is delivered in different packages throughout the network. And what connects the network and the way we do things is basically that every little node has an IP address. And an IP address is uh, an internet, internet protocol address, basically depending on, uh, they have to be unique. Um, since the internet was invented many, soon, many years ago, um, the IPv protocols have been updated from time to time. And um, uh, the reason why this is particularly interesting for us to understand now is because uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the protocol that defines all these things was updated to called IPv6. And uh, it essentially is, is how many IP addresses are possible because you can understand that depending on how many uh, numbers you have or how many digits you have in, a, in an address, also defines how many unique addresses you can give. So one of the needs were more addresses. Um, and it was because the, the, the mantra started to be defined as there is a need for connect everything uh, to the internet. Uh, this obviously have obstacles from uh, <laughs> privacy, security, uh, technical a lot of different issues that needs to be addressed uh, or will be addressed uh, also both today and also in, in other sessions but that was the reason for this but to have an address that is not enough because you also need to have uh, you know devices and protocols and uh, 
and technologies that connect uh, these different things. So let's look into the some of the obvious ones, right? Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, this slide, you probably identify easily that the first one is the Bluetooth. Uh, Bluetooth is uh, I'm wearing a uh, an Apple headset right now, um, and uh, I connect to Bluetooth when I'm in my car. I connect to my radio when I'm home. I uh, even uh, connect the mouse and the keyboard and everything using Bluetooth. So it's a it's a, a close range uh, technology uh, developed by uh, Ericsson as many years ago. Uh, Ericsson is a provider of infrastructure for the mobile phones uh, globally. Uh, so though they don't do any mobile phones themselves anymore, they still very uh, very good on on uh, the uh, the infrastructure of things. Um, Bluetooth is uh, named after the, the Danish king back in eight eight hundred century. That was uh, his name was Harold Bluetooth, and uh, he was uh, the first king of Denmark at that time that were connecting into one kingdom. So I think that is a great name for having a, a technology that connects devices and technologies and you know all these kind of things. So that is that is a that's why it's a rune that has been used for for this uh, uh, this uh, simple. Then the next one is Wi-Fi. Uh, we're all using Wi-Fi. That is um, uh, you know uh, become a standard. That is uh, and first thing you do when you come to an airport is connect to the Wi-Fi hotspot because that is where you get connected. If you don't want to use the last one that you see on the slide, which is the cellular or the mobile uh, connectivity, um, and then in the middle. Uh, I will get back to the mobile connectivity in a second because in the middle between the Wi-Fi and the and the and the mast, there is the the NFC or the near field uh, communication, which have also become a tremendously important part of our daily life. Uh, since I got my latest uh, mobile phone, I am literally not having any wallet uh, anymore. I'm. I think that maybe 90, 95% of my payments for groceries, for for restaurants, for uh, all the things that I use to pay, I use my mo mobile phone. I don't need to have my wallet. And I think the only reason I have my wallet in my car is essentially because I still need to have a driver's license in a physical form, which is kind of strange when you think of that. So many things is now electronically that you still have like passports, driver licenses and other kind of uh, papers that you need to carry around. Uh, but these are the four uh, dominant technologies for how we access data uh, from different devices to different devices. I said that I just wanted to get back to the mast and the and mobile network because, as you know, we are uh, mostly using 4G and uh, most all over the world right now. But Right now, uh, a lot of companies are rolling out 5G. And uh, I think as Industry 4.0 as Smart Factory is extremely important, I also think that uh, the, the 5G will have a huge influence on a lot of businesses. Because uh, first of all, you get uh, extremely fast speed and you get uh, uh, a lot of uh, possibilities like uh, um, how you can you can always have access points because you have a, a way denser network of masts and antennas and and the 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 fact that the technology is so fast will enable a lot of new uh, technologies uh, for example one of the things that we are thinking about when it comes to inkish is that today when broadcast live from uh, trade shows uh, we are limited to bandwidth of the wi-fi network and the wi-fi network is you typically, when you go to a, a, an exhibition hall, it's kind of limited because it's shared with all the exhibitors and all the guests. With uh, with five uh, G, uh, it's, it's of course you still have the bandwidth issue, but you have a way broad bandwidth when it comes to that because you can have uh, you can you can make a seamless uh, crossovers between different uh, providers and make sure that you have. Uh, 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 always on kind of system and the, and the speed is. Uh, so fast that, that we will be able to deliver both 4K and 8K uh, video quality uh, from multiple sources in real time without any lacking or anything. And you can see that even though I'm on a 
the Wi-Fi network here in the company, we still have like limited quality of video and we have fallouts from time to time. I think that these things is something that, especially in the places where you have uh, widely available 5G, you will not see these kind of issues. But when it comes to the Internet of Things and the Industry 4.0, uh, that we also have other kinds of uh, connectivity. Um, in this example, I will not dig into each of the ones now, but you can see that I have uh, seven different logos uh, from other kinds of technologies that all serve different purposes. Some are specifically for for the industrial uh, things uh, before rolling out the IoT and and the, and the Industry 4.0. Uh, others are have different approaches and protocols because for security reasons or for for other reasons that that uh, you may uh, need to uh, know about so it's not just the four and the top but there's more and there's probably more than the ones i just found by searching for uh, information before uh, preparing this uh, uh, show here <clears throat> so all the things that we're talking about and, and that is why also this aligns very much with uh, with what you are um, what we're talking about in this week when we had the smart factory and, and learn with us uh, events is about um, this new term that will uh, probably change a lot of things uh, maybe as uh, one of the participants uh, mentioned a couple of days ago in, in a session is that maybe uh, we will not talk about this in a short time because we basically uh, uh, already um, um, uh, everything will be so aligned with the, the technology that we buy that we won't think of it as anything uh, different. Uh, I had a little funny experience yesterday because for a long time we didn't have an inkjet printer at home. And yesterday evening, uh, we, uh, my wife, she wanted to have one and we installed a, a Canon a small desktop printer uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in my house. And my eldest son, oldest son, a, a mess, he was very impressed when the paper came out. He said, it's fantastic to see a paper printed like this, just come out of a machine of nothing. And that is, you know, today, I think that most people think that is so natural, but think about it. It is actually fantastic that you can see a piece of paper being printed uh, with uh, uh, interconnectivity using a Wi-Fi connection and, you know, this kind of thing. So I think that these things will be as much part of our lives that we will not even think about it, right? Uh, some of the things we've been talking about, I can see that I have accidentally added robots two times, but that is because I'm probably too tired when I'm doing these presentations. But some of the things that belongs to the term of Industry 4.0 is 3D, uh, 3D printing, robots, automation, IoT, which we're talking about now, cloud computing, uh, AI for, for artificial intelligence, augmented reality, big data, smart sensors, and location detection. All the things that will make our, uh, not only the industry smarter, but also uh, our homes. Maybe you have already invested in, in wireless speakers in your house. Maybe you have surveillance equipment. Maybe you have... Uh, uh, Philips Huey light bulbs installed so they have IP addresses and so on. All these things are connected uh, with the IPv6 protocol, as I mentioned in the beginning, and all of these things are changing our, our way of living and our way of consuming um, everything that is electronic, basically. Uh, I think that from a democratization perspective, this is, of course, something that needs to be considered also for uh, privacy reasons, but also because if you look at um, uh, some of the things that, that has always been an issue in, in rolling out the technologies that you leave countries, nations, populations who don't have access to these things because they are too expensive or they require a different uh, set of uh, infrastructure. But the fact is that this industry 4.0 as a term and the elements that we're talking about are here now. It's not something that we expect to be here shortly. It's here now. That is, of course, something that uh, I think that everybody needs to pay attention to, especially if we are in a manufacturing company, because as uh, Henry Christensen said in the previous session, uh, you are, of course, always uh, under uh, a big uh, competition uh, from, from your, obviously from your competitors, but also from uh, parallel industries, so to speak. So. Uh, why should you consider having a robot in your production? Yeah, you should do that because if you're if your competitor has robots, they will be more efficient than you are. So eventually, you can take you out of business if you're not really into all the things that you will need in the future. Right. 
So what does this enable? Um, well, um, as already mentioned, uh, mass surveillance is obviously something that you know it's it's there now. Uh, if you if you're concerned about George Orwell's 1984, uh, I think that we are way beyond that point. Of course, not so much with the uh, the dark things of uh, how 1984 is is uh, describing uh, the downsides of mass surveillance. But I think that we have to accept that we have surveillance on highways to ensure traffic. Uh, we have surveillance in the city centers to avoid crime. Uh, we have mass surveillance in many, many different uh, forms and shapes. Uh, one of the things that, for example, I didn't mention before that is also kind of mass surveillance, which you, you see today, is uh, the use of beacons. Uh, beacons are small transmitters that are very, very inexpensive that you can use. For example, in uh, supermarkets or at trade shows or in different public places. And the difference between uh, a beacon compared to, for example, NFC is first of all, it has a wider uh, uh, distance it can approach. But secondly, maybe even more important is also that it can broadcast. So basically, if you have an app and you have allowed to, for example, if you could, if you go to a shopping mall and you connect to the Wi-Fi network, I'm pretty sure that if you look at the small small print and the terms, you will you will have accepted that they can actually broadcast your uh, behavior and your information. Uh, I think that one of the things that I have not seen the results of it, but quite interesting was that at Printing United in Dallas last year. Uh, uh, everything was uh, uh, with, with their beacons. So I'm pretty sure that Napco and, and Supers and his people have a pretty good idea about uh, the the moving patterns in uh, the exhibition hall and how long time people spent in front of a specific exhibitor and all these kind of things. It's also massive bills is also part of this uh, uh, industry 4.0 where you have the capabilities of uh, a lot of uh, IP addresses to be used. Of course, we use also this for entertainment. Uh, I don't want to talk so much about that right now, but 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 as you know, uh, uh, all your kids' gaming devices also become part of this, which also opens up for for other questions in relation to privacy and also because I mean, if you have a if you have privacy problems yourself, what does it do to you that you give your kids, for example, a uh, some Nintendo Game Boys or something like that. No, that's not called Game Boy anymore. It's called like uh, the Switch. Sorry, that's the latest version. If you gave them uh, this kind of thing, then you give kind of equipment to minors that have not. They don't may not may not know. They are not giving the permission, and they are not legally allowed to give the permission because they are still uh, under uh, the, the legal age to make their own decision. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that also. Is not just a political, but also an ethical uh, discussion that we need to talk about at some point, maybe not in this session, but something that you need to talk about, of course. Autonomous vehicles, I mean, uh, it will be here, uh, even though there's also a lot of things uh, in, in, in work when it comes to autonomous vehicles, it can be in you know all kinds of shapes and forms. Uh, smart factories. Uh, one thing that I added to the presentation since the last time is the lights out production. Because what happens if we are able to, with robots and sensors and production that we don't even need employees in our factories anymore? Uh, there's, that is also something that it enables. Uh, as uh, also uh, our friends from Horizon, uh, Taki and, and Bang said this morning, of course, the optimization and, uh, of, of the production, but also uh, predictive maintenance and all the things that comes as part of this industry is, of course, uh, something that we need to uh, look into. Then I have written predictive purchases. Um, uh, I think it sounds kind of strange because if you look at it, I think that predictive purchase is basically saying that, okay, if you buy a piece of paper, maybe you want to buy an envelope. But with this uh, technology, you are actually able to be directed from your shopping cart in your shopping mall to go directly to that place where that's located. And, and all the logic and, and uh, AI around your purchases will form you into a new product, enabling you to uh, become, as you know already, the product, right? So something that is uh, interesting and funny 
to explore and at the same time maybe also sometimes a little bit of a challenge right so the advantage is of course the optimization production the plant maintenance when it comes to the printing industry of course better product development remote service and new finance models you maybe think that okay this is uh, interesting what is it about for example new financing models yeah for example when when uh, uh, when companies sell equipment like either it's a uh, uh, you know, a fixed cost, or it's a click-based cost, or it's a, a service cost. I mean, all these things that you do is basically that it, that that we all chase ways of how to make the most money out of the way that we operate. On the other hand, we also all all of us are interested in having variable cost models. But if you don't have enough close knowledge about what's actually going on. Uh, in a production, for example, how should you then be able to give data that is precise enough for having financing models that are based on uh, purely on consumption and these kind of behaviors? And and uh, I think you can imagine that if you look at, for example, again, uh, the presentation from Horizon, or also if you look at the presentation yesterday from HP, uh, uh, the software and the hardware start communicating with each other in ways that we have never seen before. And suddenly we start to get very, very detailed uh, usage plans or overview. So now it's easier for a vendor to say that, okay, you pay this per whatever unit you choose because we know exactly what's going on in your in your printing company. Of course, you still have to think about changes because I, you know, I think that one thing is, is obvious is that, for example, the COVID-19 has uh, changed uh, the the demand for certain products rapidly and therefore sometimes you cannot change things as fast as the if you have for example diseases or or situations like cat catastrophes or these kind of things so i think this is uh, something that is quite interesting but i think it will when <laughs> when things re return to normal i think that we will have you know great opportunities to, opportunities to think in also new ways of uh, ensuring that uh, that we we grow more together with our vendors in order to to make money of both of us right disadvantages i think that a disadvantage is 24 7 monitoring because you mean sometimes it's nice to be able to close your windows and your doors and just be on your own uh, that will for sure be more difficult in the future i think then it's also critical production data shared and one of the concerns we for example raised uh, about, for example, uh, some of the print vendors, how they use the data is basically, if we take the super optimized production, and take the, those data, which is a competitive advantage, of course, and give that to a less effective printing company to make them more effective, then uh, of course you can say that is typical benchmark data. But on the other hand, you can also say that you're taking your hard work from one, uh, customer and give it to one that is less um, critical to their own production efficiency and that will eliminate some kind of competition and I, and that will also lead to both democratization of pricing but it will also lead to uh, other things like lesser competition between uh, vendors and therefore also maybe fewer uh, a, a smaller diversity in products through like that so there's you know constant pros um, and there's, of course, a lot of more things that you have to look into before you decide for yourself uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, how you want to share the data and how you want to do things. Then let's look a little bit about the players because I mean, ob obviously, this is something that you ca you cannot say, nah, I'm not interested. Uh, so this is just a very 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 brief uh, overview of some of the players in the market that have. Uh, have a very um, uh, proactive approach to how to use IoT and how to connect and how to make sure that this works. But this is something that everybody is doing. I think that regardless whether customers like the printers will will use these services, regardless of whether they can, can use them or uh, they believe they need them, I think that vendors that are not able to deliver uh, Industry 4.0 uh, enabled devices in the future and think about how to utilize all these things uh, they will be out of business before i mean <laughs> you can't you can't survive in my opinion if you are not into this this is the new 
way of the industry, how it thinks. And tomorrow we're going to talk about the digital mindset that will also hopefully be an eye opener for you why this is so important, not just as a production, but also in general things. Right after my session here, uh, we have uh, the uh, great pleasure of, uh, of welcoming uh, Steve Metcalf from, uh, from Baldwin. Uh, and the reason I mentioned this with the word interconnectivity on the screen is um, one thing is that all the vendors are producing equipment with all the uh, bells and whistles that we have just been talking about. But uh, most printing companies have more than one vendor. So how do we make sure that the data is, is uh, connected with each other? Uh, how do we make sure that the that the AIs and business models uh, that are formed based on this knowledge is, uh, is possible to formulate based on, you know, you cannot just look at the binding side, you have to look at the printing side, you have to look at the preprint side, you have to look at the shipping side. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be connected. And um, uh, Baldwin is a company that I think most people know from being a supplier of consumables. A couple of years ago, they invested in EMS uh, spectral UV, and uh, they have also uh, camera inspection systems and other technologies that are not really into the consumables. And um, Steve used to be the, the 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 president of EMS, but after the acquisition uh, a couple of years ago, and then last year, I think it was, he was now promoted to be uh, responsible for their uh, ways of thinking about the interconnectivity. And uh, they have spent the year in thinking of a platform called um, uh, AMP. And, uh, and you should look forward to that because I think that similar to how, for example, Heidelberg's uh, Psycho is uh, thinking about connecting all these devices into a unified universe, I think that AMP is on the same track. Uh, so uh, you should definitely uh, look into this session that is in half an hour from now uh, with Steve Metcalf. And then of course you can think about also a question that is uh, the rollout of this. Uh, I think that it's many, many, many years ago we started to hear about JDF and how that would, would uh, change the world and how printing companies would use that to roll out the job tickets throughout the process electronically so you didn't have to have the the, the physical uh, order back, right? But um, this is totally different. Now this is because the internet is way more mature. Uh, the IPv6 gives you the, uh, the, the ability to connect devices. Uh, and uh, um, I think that all vendors are looking into getting these devices to market as soon as possible because they basically believe that it will also be an opportunity for them to connect closer to the printing companies. As uh, everybody in these sessions the past day have been talking about internet, uh, sorry, uh, the, the industry 4.0 or the smart factory is not just about uh, the technology side. It's also about how vendors and printers will in the future work way closer together because the investment horizon is not just very short it's it's a, you're building a relationship so you need to have the right technology the right partners in order to get this done and if you do that and you find the ones that you you believe can support your business objectives uh, then basically i believe this rollout will be way faster than most uh, the price of this well we have talked about some of the price issues in relation to uh, to let's say the the pricing when it comes to for example the the cost of giving data right that is something that i would be i wouldn't be concerned about it but it would be definitely be something that i would look into the contract how data can be shared how it can be used how you can make sure that the data is not uh, used to uh, to give too many advantages to your competition, basically, because this will be this will dem democratize the the production work workflow. I'm totally uh, sure about that. Then the price of the technology itself. Uh, well, as I also asked uh, Tagetsu Busan from uh, from Horizon in the morning session, was what about all the companies, for example, in the developing countries that don't really need this right now? They have a an exceed of labor, they have cheap labor, they have maybe less 
need for these kind of things, which always is a subject for discussion, of course. But I think it's a fact that, you know, I was at the, at the printing show in, um, in Delhi just four years ago, I think. And when you saw an exhibitor presenting a saddle stitch machine that was not a machine that was like a manual saddle stitch where it had like one stitcher at a time. And I saw a guy, you know, manually taking, uh, you know, signature by signature and stitching one stitch two times in it. I was just asked him, why are you not using two stitches at the time at least? And he said, no, no, no. The cost of doing two stitches is way higher than having a person working as labor thing. So that, you know, to so, so some extent when we talk about pricing in this, I think that regardless how, of how much we want this to be part of the value chain throughout the world, I'm totally convinced that in low labor cost uh, countries, uh, the rollout of this for some printing companies will be way down the, <laughs> the road before you see anything uh, that relates to this. The actual price of uh, the technology, uh, we are, in a market that is to some extent decreasing. So I think that these kind of things is the, maybe the printing vendors opportunity to place themselves closer to the, to the actual production without owning the production, which will give them a lot more information that can develop new products and services that will enable them to still continue to grow and develop services that are interesting. So I don't think there will be a price tag on it right now. I think that the, the binding equipment you will buy, the printing device you will buy, the software you will buy, will probably have pricing that is similar to what you know today, but the technology, technology like the IoT enabling things will be part of that offering, whether you're using, using it or not. I don't think it will be optional on many on many of the machines, to be honest. Um, so that is, of course, something that that is is good <laughs> because you don't have to pay extra for it, and you will eventually have a printing company where everything is is uh, already in it. But of course, this is something that um, uh, time will show, I guess, right? We have written a lot of articles on uh, English News uh, about. Uh, IoT, the smart factory. Uh, and this week, uh, my fantastic colleagues, uh, Eve uh, and Jacques from, from uh, English France and English uh, Benelux have in both English, Dutch and French written articles that are simply amazing, talking about uh, what you what we've been talking about here, but in more way more technical details and, and uh, way better than that I may have presented it here. But um, I hope this was a little inspiration for you. Uh, I hope this is uh, something that is useful because that is, uh, you know, when you spend time, I spend time, when everybody watches this, spend time. Obviously, it's uh, important that we are uh, not wasting each other's time. So uh, thank you for now. Uh, we, I'm ahead of time, uh, which is not so often that I'm ahead of time. So uh, I will take questions if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, so here, I'm back. So. Um, let me uh, hear, uh, or if you want to join me for a chat about these things, you can just click on the, on the let's see, request to speak button in the top of the corner, and then you will be invited in here, live video session with uh, your favorite editor from your favorite media in the printing industry. Uh, uh, that's me, that's English, that's what I mean. Uh, sorry. So um, any questions? Ah, Jacob, you are my savior. Uh, it will be expensive to have two work streams, one for digital equipment and one analog. Oh, sorry, you wrote that as a private thing. Hmm, damn, now I just, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe it's a comment that basically that, Jacob, why don't you just join me? Uh, I know you have a session tomorrow, but please join me and then I will just, uh, I will just, uh, I would like to talk to you. If you're still there, of course, let's see. I have just clicked on the invite button. See, this is one of the things that is also quite cool about uh, these kind of technologies because you're able to invite people to participate in uh, discussions and uh, in uh, basically sharing information. Uh, I think that sometimes people believe that I try to be the Mr. Wise guy that know everything. I don't, but I really would like to be the initiator of um, the conversation. And uh, I think that this uh, this uh, session here 
uh, and also all the previous sessions during the past days have been an enabler uh, that uh, hopefully opens up for um, some kind of uh, interest for where the market is going, right? Okay, I got Jacob here. Sorry that I didn't see your hand was raised. <laughs> Hang on a second and he will be here. One of the things I can say while I'm waiting for Jacob or questions is uh, also um, we will uh, cut all the episodes up and put them on English so it will be easier to read and find and there will be subtitles on on uh, the on the on the sessions. Um, however, if you can't wait to get over this week, you can just click on all the links that we have shared on uh, uh, social media. Uh, so you can click on any of the past sessions and then you will have a direct link to the replays. So if you have an interest in something that that is uh, perfectly okay. Jacob, finally, you're my savior. You always join my sessions. I like that a lot. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, I find a very interesting one. I find them really interesting. Yeah. That's great. Just, uh, for people who don't know you, you are Jacob Hededam Homo and uh, you used to work for Heidelberg, but I think in this context, maybe a little bit more interesting, you have also been uh, working in a printing company. So you know also what the challenges are with printing companies. Let me ask you a question here. If you look at, at uh, some of the printing companies that you have worked for, um, how difficult do you think it will be for them to um, adapt into the 4.0 into industry and, and you know take this technology under the hood and start using it? Yeah, and and I think that was actually part of my my the reason for my comment more. I, I think it's uh, sorry that I think, I think it was private. <laughs> ah, no, no, it, it was totally okay. okay. So so, mm. um, well, uh, take take you back. I think you mentioned it. I was the, the guys from from that you had had on previously uh, when we uh, were at Drupal two thousand and the evolution of of a JDF slash JMF. Uh, you couldn't navigate down through the hallways of, of Drupa because you were falling all over the place of beach flags and banners saying JDF, JDF. Nobody actually understood what it was and how it could, how it was beneficial for their productivity or earnings in when doing print. I think that there's a risk, a huge risk, that with IoT, we just found another buzzword that would do the revolution of, of the industry if we are not careful. Uh, and I think the challenge, and I think this is where we need as a supplier, we need to raise the bar in the discussion and say, well, uh, we have a tool which is excellent, which can automate, because that's basically what we're looking for, automation. Uh, so let's, let's, let's make these platforms or these, uh, the, the equipment connectable and open. Uh, but my reason for my comment is, as long as we have a distinguished analog way of producing stuff, you know, the mindset still in silos and then the automatic way where we have all the connectivity between devices and work streams, that will be extremely expensive. And uh, I, I find it really a big issue to see two different strategies because you, you know, you have one way of communicating, one way of driving productivity downstream, manually handing over jobs and informations, and then you have the total connected work stream. Those two does not go hand in hand really good. So there mm. needs to be a very clear strategy from a print house to answer your question. When do you have the switch over? Mm. And uh, taking from your discussions yesterday of the web to print, how far inside the order flow do you mm. as an owner of a web to print system, do you actually demand the information to float in? Where is the first mm. touch point inside your print shop when you have information delivered from a web? That same question should be raised when you look at the production inside. So how many work steps or touch points would you allow in a connected work stream? Mm. Uh, those things are so important for a successful implementation. Did that mm. kind of answer your question? Mm, yes and no. I will, I will try mm. to ask one more yeah. time just before I do that. I, I was just curious, did you see the HP presentation of Skyflow yesterday? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Because uh, I think that to to some extent that also answered one of your sayings right now. Because there was the Infico platform for 
where you connect an interface to the to the end customer, right? And then it was integrated into Siteflow, so you could easily see there was this switch over between the web to print and where the printing company. And I think that Dr. Gibson, he he was very clear. He said that we are not an MIS system. We are not a production workflow system. We are interface to the to the at least both from the APIs, but also the interface to the to the humans on the other side of the screens. And and maybe maybe some of the touch points that you're also talking about, maybe it's also one of the questions that you can keep asking is that how do you define what touch points belong to what kind of flows? Because uh, I know that you've been working with Prenec and I think that Prenec is maybe one of the few systems where you have real end-to-end -end solutions, right? Because you, you have a position, you have MIS, you have uh, production planning, you have everything. But I think that most printing companies today, they have a, they have like thousands of different pieces of hardware and software that needs to interoperate with each other. Exactly, and that, that was why, with all respect, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I looked deeply in Figo previously as well, and I think they have a great system, and also Siteflow is an excellent system. But with all respect to these guys from yesterday, you know, the complexity uh, of in a print shop, which is not purely digital, or who is not only producing one kind of, you know, one kind of kit, uh, which is, I guess, the normal or 90% of all print shop or, or PSPs, they will be challenged with a system like that. I know if you have one of a kind that you need to produce in the same way every time on the same piece of equipment, then this is much more easy. But the reality but, of life is normally yeah, that's not how yeah. we see print shops. Yeah. But but I think that maybe it's because if you look at, at uh, the mantra of web to print at least till now, it's been very much that you have identified products with different specific sets of parameters for each of them, right? I think yeah. that what you refer to is you you work in a in a, in an accident uh, printing company where I mean every order was different format, different substrate, different color state, different whatever, right? And that's what yeah. you refer to basically that the web to print experience is maybe not so good right now when it comes to the diversity of what a, a traditional commercial printer is, is uh, operating with today. And, and I see these systems, uh, not the web to print because I, I like the idea of web to print just to, uh, you know, have to be a sales channel or service channel to serve print customers. I, I, I definitely see a need of some additional intelligence happening when you receive the orders, how to drive a gang and how to make sure that you don't do new make readies all the time when you're shifting in and out of formats or paper stocks, uh, grammage, et cetera. Where do you do the planning? So, mm -hmm. so the reduction, and we will touch this tomorrow, I hope, uh, when Anthony and I will do a presentation. Uh, how many touch points do you as a PSP have, have inside uh, your print shop? Because that is a mm -hmm. focus that you need to be very much aware of when you implement Industry 4.0. Mm. I think that also relates a little bit because tomorrow afternoon we also have the session with uh, Diego Diaz from uh, yeah. uh, formerly the, the the Bernard Group. You you, you met him in Copenhagen in, at our non event last year, right? Uh, but but one of the things I was really fascinated about with him, and that was also touched by Luke Peters in our session on Monday afternoon, um, that is, for example, just like one of the touch points. Where do you want the imposition to take place? Because do you want it to be Taken care of uh, on the machines, uh, in the rips, uh, in the in the web to print solution, in the uh, MISs. I mean, you can have different places, and that I think that the decisions you make on where, and that's why I'm saying that maybe the touch point when they are defined, maybe you can easily say that where is the flip over from what kind of technology you should use for having these kind of things. For example, uh, what I liked about the Bernard Group, where where Diego was uh, the the CTO. Um, was that they had like they had the, I think it was eight uh, HP twelve thousand and they also used to have a couple of of jet presses and then they have a lot of binding equipment and that was like uh, when they planned the jobs they didn't plan the job for a specific machine they had like last minute imposition so basically when an operator was free from the previous job he just tagged the number and then basically gave the imposition that fitted that machine basically right uh so so there's i, I think that that is also some some of the changes one, one thing is that also that henry christiansen mentioned in the, in the previous in the previous session is that <laughs> you have all the, the cost models that we have like if you have full cost or absor absorption cost models and uh, and you have uh, i mean everything when we talk to the smart factory 
I believe is in open discussion right now, right? It's the business model, it's how we communicate with customers, it's how we plan our production, how the relationship mm -hmm. with the vendors are. So I'm, then I return to the question, in your experience with the printing company that you used to work for, mm -hmm. do you think they are capable of getting this under the hood and implementing this? Because the reason I ask specific, not specifically about this, I will not name the, the company, but I'm interested because they are, maybe typical european kind of uh, 100 person company right and i'm yep. just i'm just wondering if if all what we are talking about this week uh, if it has uh, ground for for real work <laughs> I, and and i'm sure it will i'm sh i'm definitely sure it will i'm not sure it will happen before we have industry 5.0, that is going to be, but we, we, no, 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 we, we, with IOT and exactly like the example that you're using for planning. So, so in my world with IOT, we are actually capable of looking or have, the equipment will tell, we have free capacity on the, our, our horizon equipment in post press area that should drive, you know, that should drive the scheduling. So we need mm -hmm. more orders of this kind because we have free capacity in this area. So instead mm -hmm. of going to a push stream, it will be a pool stream of jobs. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. should be reflected all the way down to the web to print portal say, well, we have now a sale of these kind of orders because we are, have free capacity in the post press area or in the press area. So mm -hmm. with IoT and connectivity, that will be a functionality which will be something that PSP owners understand. I can get more jobs through much. And this is why they will adapt um, mm. the models and the technology. And that that also kind of leads back to when I saw Sideflow yesterday, because I think that uh, with Sideflow, you know, enabling collaboration on a global scale, uh, vendor agnostic, uh, at least what they say, um, I think that is uh, like we spoke about that, that we have web to print as one uh, sales channel. You have maybe APIs as a second channel. I mean, basically, it's a matter of how to fill out uh, the production capacity you have in order to be profitable. Right? That that also that lead me to maybe uh, the last question because we still have uh, soon have Steve here. Um, I was just I was just a little bit curious because uh, when you said that, for example, that it will be a pull. Uh, effect instead of a push effect do you think that and, and it was just a crazy idea so maybe it's uh, way off but if you look at the front end of a web to print solution uh, i think that most web to print solutions today they have like uh, uh, the the marketing manager decide what kind of products to push or uh, uh, you know we have this special offer this week or then we push it on the on all the social media channels to attract you know the audience for this one do you think that maybe there will be some way back to the web to print solution? So let's say that the printing company have capacity for a certain product, then it will automatically start to create demand, will automatic or uh, a marketing presence on the website, and then essentially also push this marketing communication to the social media channels. So you see a full implementation backwards to the demand creation as well. That, that would be a natural step. And that was exactly yeah. my point. That will be a natural step that these systems finally get connected. Uh, and so finally uh, so uses the data to configure or drive mm -hmm. more sales and uh, additional uh, upstream order intake. So you and I, we should call Douglas afterwards and give him this business idea and charge him a consultancy fee, right? I'm, I'm sure that Douglas is already thinking about, Ooh, if I could get my hands on the capacity uh, downstream, I would love to mm. use that to price products. Mm. Uh, That's great. Of course. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Mark. Jacob, uh, thank you for joining me as usual. I, I really appreciate it. It's good to talk to you and uh, I'm Likewise. sure we'll see each other later. Okay, great. Definitely. Well, I will just... Uh...